So we're gonna, we're gonna introduce this again, so you know who everyone is. I'm Michael Walker, this is The Fix. We're discussing freedom of movement and Corbyn's comments yesterday on Andrew Marr, which were specifically him, I was just listening to those voices to see if it's to tell me the sound's not there again, but I think the sound is here. Uh, it was uh, Corbyn talking about how Labour will be abandoning freedom of movement and specifically talking about the importation, or his words, the importation of workforces from Eastern Europe to damage labour conditions in the UK. That's what we'll be discussing tonight. To do so, I'm delighted to be joined by Zoe Gardner, who's from another Europe and a PhD student who's going to introduce yourself again this time with the sound on. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm with Another Europe is Possible, um, who we campaigned for a left-wing Remain vote and now we're trying to influence the Brexit negotiations uh, and I'm particularly interested in defending freedom of movement within that. And I'm studying for, for a PhD about uh, European refugee policy and the impact that civil society groups can have on that. But you've had you've had now five minutes to sum it up in two sentences. So. <laughs> Ooh, wait. I'm joking. I'm You're joking. Being harsh, I'm yeah. being harsh. Come on. Uh, also joined by Petros Elia, who is General Secretary of the United Voices of the World, an independent union. Do you want to talk a bit about your trade union and the work you do? Yeah. So UBW is a trade union which organises and represents uh, some of the most unrepresented and unorganised workers in the labour market in London and uh, almost all of our members are, are migrant workers uh, that work in, in the service sector and uh, which is by definition a, lo a low paid sector. So low paid migrant workers are basically who we're representing and organising. Brilliant. Also joined by Eddie Dempsey from the RMT. Tell us a bit about your union, what you do with them. Yeah, so the RMT is an industrial trade union, represents everybody in the transport industry and also includes the maritime sector and offshore gas and energy sector. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm on a national executive. My job's a trade driver. I've been elected to represent my members nationally for mm -hmm. three years, conducting strikes and all the rest of it, making those decisions. And when my three years is up, I go back to my job on the railway. And Antonia Bright, I'm not actually sure if the audience heard you again, but we're going to repeat again if it's repetitive, sorry. Uh, you've just come from a demo and you're an organiser with Movement for Justice. Yeah, yeah. Movement for Justice by any means by necessary. By any means necessary. Uh, do you want to tell us about tell us about the demo you were on or that's still going on and tell us about Movement for Justice? Yeah, the demo was for um, another young guy who died in police hands just um, a day or two ago in Hackney. Um, Stoke Newington Police, notorious police force, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah, that's like people have just been marching through the, the streets now. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, Movement for Justice. So we're about building a movement that's fighting for real progress, real equality and justice, and that means there's a central question of fighting racism and fighting for immigrant rights mm -hmm. at the heart of anything that's fighting for progress. So that's why we prioritise that. Brilliant. And yeah, the, you, the audience might know Movement for Justice by the demos they organise at Yarlswood, which are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Yarlswood's a women's detention centre. Yeah. On the outskirts of London, I can't remember exactly so where it is. The, in the farmland of Bedfordshire. In the farmland of Bedfordshire. Yeah. Cool. Uh, to set us off, I'm going to read out some of Corbyn's answers uh, so we can talk not so much in abstract terms but about what was actually said. Uh, so Andrew Marr is asking him... Uh, what am I going to go for? He's asking him about freedom of movement. We're going to go for the big ones. So, he's saying, we're not going to have freedom of movement anymore. Brexit means we leave the single market. Leaving the single market means we don't have freedom of movement. Specifically, he says, migration would be, man would be a managed thing on the basis of the work required. There would be European workers working in Britain and British workers working in Europe as there are at the moment. What there wouldn't be is the wholesale importation of underpaid workers from Central Europe in order to destroy conditions, particularly in the construction industry. Uh, then Andrew Marr asks, so, do you, so how do you stop that? Under your plan, how do you stop that happening? Corbyn says, you prevent agencies recruiting whole-scale workforces that like. He's got a funny way of speaking sometimes, hasn't he? You advertise for jobs in the locality first. Uh, and then he says, listen, they would come here on the basis of the jobs available and their skill sets to go with it. What we wouldn't allow is the practice by agencies who are quite disgraceful the way they do it, recruit workforce, low paid, and bring them here in order to dismiss an existing workforce in the construction industry, then pay them low wages. It's appalling, and the only people who benefit are the companies. Uh, we'll leave it there. I'm going to go one by one through, through the panel and ask 
how reasonable you think those statements were? Is there an element of truth in it? Is it... I don't know, I'll, I won't guess your answers. Zoe? Uh, well, I think what was um, almost funny, if it wasn't so sad, was how um, Ma really exposed the inconsistencies and uh, the sort of lack of a real credible proposal here in terms of immigration policy from Labour. They don't have anything concrete um, to propose as an alternative to freedom of movement, which they say has to go just because it just does. Um, but what he's talking about here, he's very confused. Um, this kind of language, like specifically singling out um, a, a group that has been racialized and abused throughout the last couple of years um, of immigrants, of, of uh, uh, saying that about you know the wholesale import of uh, Central Europeans, like that kind of language, I would find genuinely quite shocking if Theresa May was starting to do that. She doesn't single out particular groups, even though her position on immigration has traditionally been far worse than Corbyn's, so it's absolutely appalling language. That quote could very easily be from Nigel Farage, I'd have believed it, no problem. That kind of language is contributing to the demonisation, the divisions in our workforce, and, and that, as anybody who um, you know has, has a left-wing or collective worker's uh, instinct at heart knows, if you divide the workforce, if you allow one group to be exploited against, right, then you weaken the entire uh, workforce, whether that's British or whatever. So Corbyn should be standing up for the rights of all workers. The best way to do that is through freedom of movement, because it prevents uh, employers from being able to discriminate. Petros? So, uh, I do believe, I mean, I only just read this, this quote just before I came, came here this evening, about 10 minutes <laughs> ago, and uh, I, I do believe my first reading of it is that it was, it was probably well-intentioned, and it, and, it, and, it, and it is it is sort of intuitive, and I think, and I think the whole the whole problem with the debate around um, migrants and the effect they have on wages and, and 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 the workforce generally is that to argue against it is sort of counterintuitive. You, you, it, the, the, the sort of the natural position is obviously if there's a, a huge supply of labour, then that's clearly going to have an effect on 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 workers' wages, uh, their bargaining power, and and all the rest of it. The problem is it, it doesn't stack up to the facts, so the, the facts would completely contradict that 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 that, that seemingly intuitive position. And what is clear is that migrant workers have zero effect on wages, have zero effect on trade union density, have zero effect on, on workers' rights and protections. And in fact, those things are obviously won by workers themselves organising and fighting for them. And, uh, you know, just without sort of going down the, the sort, of, um, sort of economic sort of route of looking at the, 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 the correlation, it's clear that there are positive correlations between migration and wages, there are positive correlations between migration and workers' rights. Um, and so, you know, it's just simply... It's, demonstrably not the case that uh, workers coming from the EU or from any other country has any effect whatsoever on rights and protections. And the problem is actually the statutory minimum protections afforded to all workers are so low, they're so poor, they're so pernicious, those are the problems. So if we want to help workers, protect workers um, against abuses, not only abuses which, which contravene the law, but abuses which actually comply with the law, and that is the problem. The law is so inadequate, the law is so... Uh, unfair and so exploitative. Uh, it allows for so many abuses, mm -hmm. abuses and different forms of exploitation to take place. The employers don't need to be unscrupulous uh, by, non by not complying with the law. They, to be unscrupulous, all you have to do is merely comply with the law because, mm -hmm. because the floor is set so low. And so it's simply not the case, and there's no evidence to, 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 to back up that statement, that uh, construction workers or any other group of workers coming from any other country in the EU or from outside the EU will negatively impact on uh, uh, work, work, workers' rights. As I said, just to finish, it's it's the it's unorganised workers mm -hmm. which bring down wages and which um, uh, remove protections. It's not migrant workers. Eddie, yeah, well, I think it's uh, a bit strange that people are criticising Corbyn from a from a supposedly left wing perspective on his comments because if you listen to what the guy was actually saying, he's talking about protecting workers from exploitation. He's not he's not attacking anyone. And uh, you know, if you think if you think of it in this way. The first international was set up with Karl Marx to prevent European employers bringing scab labour into Britain, undermining trade union organisation here. So it's precisely in those terms that Corbyn was speaking. And I think what this is hiding, this narrative that he's attacking migrants, is actually something a bit more sinister. I think what it is, is a smokescreen for pro-EU sentiment, and it lines up very neatly with the right-wing part of the Labour Party who are trying to undermine Corbyn's position on Brexit, which is hugely popular with the working class in this country. It's not a racist position, anything he said. And what he's talking about is protecting workers from exploitation. 
So I think all of this, all of this sort of um, outrage about, you know, he's attacking migrants, he's a racist comments, I think is just a left-wing covering for quite a right-wing argument and plays into the hands of the right-wing of the Labour Party and it shouldn't be supported. And I think most workers in the country ain't mm -hmm. going to fall for it either. Mm -hmm. Antonia? I mean, yeah, <coughs> it's, it's the fundamentally the Achilles heel uh, for the left is the question of racism. If you do not fight racism, and that means explicitly taking the side of the people who face racism and xenophobia and attacks, then you <coughs> divide the very people who ought to be allies, like the very means of fighting for anything progressive is undermined and it's undercut uh, the working class in Britain consistently and labour positions have undercut the fight for workers' rights consistently because they don't, because they just fail on the question of anti-racism. Anti-racism isn't just when you're anti-fascist. It means that you're standing up, you, you have to see yourself as equals. And at the end of the day, Corbyn's position does, does attack migrants from Central Europe for a start. I mean, it's not protecting workers' rights if it just means protecting British citizens' workers' rights. It's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's nationalist. It's going in a nationalist direction. And it will feed that. And so unless there's a conscious and explicit fight that is defending migrant rights, and to be quite honest, I'm in a trade union. I've been in a trade union a long time. And one of the best strikes I've seen was just last week, and tomorrow there'll be a strike again for another two weeks, it's all migrant workers, St. Bart's hospitals, all migrant workers working in these outsourced companies. The whole point of outsourcing was undercutting and undermining workers. You know, in public services where the unions have been very strong in, the, in its history, undercut and undermine <coughs> outsourcing. Who is leading the fight? Who is leading the fight to win real rights, to, to fight for better conditions in the workplace? Um, for, for different paying conditions to break the back of this privatisation that has up till now really um, put us in a, mm -hmm. a dreadful situation. If you want to use the word destroy as, as Corbyn does, what's destroying, you know, the conditions of the working class, you know, those policies which um, are being fought the hardest by migrant workers who face not only the conditions under, you know, like their managements and those corporations that exploit them, like super mm -hmm. exploit them, but have on top of that immigration <coughs> issues all the time to like make you more vulnerable and bombard you. I'm sorry, but we need those workers if we're going to fight for a better condition of life in, these in this country. We need those people who can lead and who have not given up on the idea mm -hmm. of actually fighting, who know what it means to lead a strike. It's not one day here and one day there. You fight to win. You actually fight to win. You have a strategy to win. We need that. That's how you rebuild. Corbyn is betraying that. What he said betrays exactly those people. And it gives the fake idea that if you're British, that somehow you can just get through and you can turn a blind eye to the reality of racism, the actual reality of it. So I want to separate two issues as far as it's possible, which is one, the effect that freedom of movement has on the structure of the labour market in Britain, the role of the trade unions in Britain, and two, the extent to how much uh, opposition to freedom of movement intersects with racism, and, or whether, whether or not it does, because I think there's, they're two quite different issues. And I think everyone's quite unclear on both. I feel, I feel unsure about both. Um, so to begin with the, the question about the labour market. So as you've both sort of introduced, the idea that Corbyn was... Seems, seems to be expressing, and one which does seem uh, plausible is the idea that migrant labour is, and because within the EU it's not, it's, not it's not about giving people British citizenship, it's about people moving here as labour, so it's people moving here, they don't get voting rights, but they come here and they're free to work. <coughs> they have and local voting rights. Local voting rights, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, you don't get British citizenship, right? No, but you, yeah. you're on a path towards it, and I think local voting rights are pretty important. 
Let me finish the question. All right. Phrase it like, <laughs> in alliance with the fact. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So then the idea is labour is brought in because it's easier to exploit. It will accept lower wages. Uh, is Because it's new to the political community, is less likely to organise in a trade union. And you explicitly talked about the motivation of freedom of movement to be to bring over potential scab labour. Yeah. Um, so let's start with you, Eddie. And I want to ask, is because this is a plausible story, but I want to ask if there are any places in Britain where you've seen this happen. You know, yeah, where... yeah. I've got first-hand experience of it. So one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest victories for cleaners in the past 10 years was a strike of mainly migrant cleaners, RMT members on the Great Western Railway. I started off organising them when we had six members out of the whole contract. And it took about three years of, of solid organising to get everyone into the union. Every time we put someone up as a local rep, they were victimised and bullied out. And eventually, through, through the course of fighting like that, workers developed their own leaders. There were two women in particular, both of them migrants, one from the Caribbean, one from Eastern Europe who came forward as leaders. Once we got those two people into position, we started to take shape on the ground and we won a series of battles there, culminating on a 40% pay rise. We won the living wage in one hit for the first time that had been done anywhere in the country. We didn't just win the living wage for those cleaners on that contract, we won it for every single contractor that Great Western Railway um, employs in any field of operation. So these people were heroes. Uh, there was a series of other victories we won after that. And immediately following that victory, because uh, one, one of the things that we won out of that was not just an improvement in wages and conditions, we also eradicated the use of zero-hour contracts, prevented the use of an additional layer of agency labour coming in. What they did is they started bringing in workers directly from Europe, mm -hmm. literally arriving in Paddington Station on the platform, to begin under the instruction of some of the managers who were, uh, I mean... How they, wanted, how they operated on a contract is they really tried to create racial divisions mm -hmm. within the workers. So in some places you had a group of Somali workers and the supervisory and managerial grades would be mainly Ghanaian and, that's, and, that's, and that would be create a sort of attention. Um, in other places it would be mainly sort of West Indian or Caribbean or African workers mm -hmm. and then attention with some groups from Eastern Europe. And, and they tried to play those tensions off. Um, and so they were bringing in workers directly from Bulgaria by Bulgarian management, mm -hmm. who had been spoken to prior about the, the conditions of the workforce there, in an attempt to break the, the trade union membership. Mm -hmm. So they brought them in deliberately under the impression you're coming here to work, and part of what you're doing is helping us eradicate this problem of union membership. I mean, we got over that eventually, but this is, this is how it operates. Yeah. And when people are talking about the free move, movement of labour, we've got to understand what it is in context. It's not a t it, this isn't a debate about immigration. This is a debate about a specific neoliberal policy that is part of the single European act, Thatcher's single act. Mm -hmm. She loved it. And the people who were the architects of it were the European Round Table of Industrialists, which is an invitation-only organisation of the CEOs of the biggest multinational corporations with headquarters in Europe. And there's specific reasons for initiating this single market of labour. It's so they've got access to a 60 million strong workforce that they can play workers off of each other. And it doesn't operate in isolation. The other side of it is the free movement of capital. So what they do is the free movement of capital wrecks your economy, and then your freedom of movement is just like Norman, Norman Tebbit said, on your bike, or go and find work somewhere else. And that's, and that's where it's not. This, this posing of it as somehow a great freedom mm. from workers is not what it's about. And no one can tell me the intention of this group, this little cabal of multinational CEOs sat around a table and said, how can we improve the working conditions for the working class in Europe? So all of that is a complete myth, as far as so I'm in, concerned. In, that's a specific situation where a job is advertised abroad, right? So yes. What's, what's the uh, European Posted Workers Directive or something? Okay, but the, Sorry, I should, have, I should know this already. But the European Posted Workers Directive is not um, a free movement of people issue. It comes under free movement of services. So it's, it's a completely different issue. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's part of the four freedoms, um, but it's, it's a very problematic directive. It basically allows you to uh, send workers temporarily to another mm. European country, but they're employed in the host, the home state. Um, they have to at least be paid minimum wage conditions in the host country, but that's obviously can be lower. So, so their employer is in 
is in is in whatever country, whatever country from. that they come from. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's very problematic. Um, and both the Commission and the European Parliament have um, raised the issue that um, only having the protections of minimum wage uh, has uh, potentially contributed towards this phenomenon. That I think I think that's actually what you're talking. Possibly, I don't know the specific instance you you refer to, but. Um, so there is a, a process of reform um, and renegotiation of that um, directive underway. It's a painfully slow process. The EU is not known for its mm. snappy decisions. But um, I mean, do they, do they want to? So, if, so we're separating two issues: one which is freedom of movement, and one which is the posted workers directive. Well, which you're saying so is freedom of services. Well, it's so important to do that. It's so important to separate that because the only way you could somehow justify what Corbyn said, although not his language in which he said it today, would be to say, okay, well, maybe he's talking about these issues that do exist with the Posted Workers Directive, that do not exist whatsoever with um, free movement of people. Um, but he didn't make that clear, and he actually, he's constantly doing this, this sort of fudge of, like, not quite spelling it all out. Either he doesn't know, or he's doing it on purpose to try to keep people like me and keep people like you on board at the same time and all of us voting Labour. And it's not going to hold. So if he's talking about postal workers, he needs to talk about postal workers and explicitly defend freedom of movement for people. But he's not doing that. Mm. He's trying to fudge and go in between and say that there's a problem here. But, um, you know, we, you know, people will still come for work, but um, not in this way. But we're not saying how that is. Like, it's just, it's, it's a total fudge. And it's, it's, it's based on the fact that they don't have a credible alternative mm. to freedom of movement to propose. Because that's directly related. I just want to, Eddie, do you think the problem in that situation was the posted workers? Or do you think no. the problem was freedom of movement? No, I mean that's explicitly what the what the what, uh, what this part of the single market is set up to do. It's explicitly what it's for. John Reid, when he was interviewed um, a while ago by Andrew Neil, when he was talking about why they didn't ask for um, periods, exception periods for newly accession states mm -hmm. in terms of free free movement of labour, it was quite explicit. He said it's, it was for wage restraint. Mm -hmm. That's what they do it for. It's completely the purpose of it. But there's no evidence and, that it actually does that. Well, I'd be inclined to think that's deliberately what they set up for. I mean, when during the EU referendum campaign, I remember I did a piece with um, on the, on the telly during the referendum campaign, and they had someone representative of the employers organisation on straight after me, and they were saying we must have access to free free movement, otherwise wages are going to go up. Mm -hmm. Lord Rose was kicking off. If we don't get free movement and labour, wages are going to go up. Because what it comes down to is this: we want to control the supply of labour and we want to control capital. <coughs> I believe in a planned economy. And I don't believe turning over an entire section of our economy to the market benefits anyone. I'm a socialist. I want to see workers having democratic control and ownership of our economy, and that includes the supply of labour. Why would you let such an important part of the economy be in the hands of the market and the corporations? That should be us to control. Isn't, isn't that the fight across the whole of Europe? Putting up like extra borders and basically saying we lock people into where you are isn't really... No, that, that's, like that's, that's not what I'm saying. There's a difference, as I've said, there's a difference between migration, mm -hmm. immigration, and specifically the freedom of movement, which is going because we're leaving the European Union and the single market. I, I want to stick on the trade unions and the labour market just for now and ask you, Petros, that you, you work in trade unions often with migrant workers. Yeah. Is that with people who are coming from the EU or people from outside the EU generally? Both. So there's a large uh, Latin American contingent in our union, which, uh, with four, which are Spanish citizens, so they moved from Latin America in the 90s and early 2000s, and then they spent many years there and got sp Spanish citizenship, and now they're living in, mm. the, in the UK. And then there's a lot of um, non-EU migrant workers as well from the Caribbean and, and various countries in Africa as well. Oh. But I just want to come back on a few points that Eddie made, because I, I, mean, I, I ultimately agree that there are advantages to, uh, to free freedom, 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 freedom of movement to employers. Uh, and they will, but employers will always try and exploit whatever divisions they can. Employers will always try and create divisions. But the, I, I don't. I just disagree on the on the solution being control. I think the solution needs to be to enhance trade union, uh, improve trade union rights. Um, you know, to get rid of all the anti-trade union uh, legislation to improve uh, employment rights generally. Um, and you know, the issue of, of, of scab labour coming in and breaking strikes has been a, an issue throughout history, hasn't it? And mm. and, and you look at the St. Bart's strike, which I'm glad you mentioned earlier because it's, it's, yeah, it's it. amazing. Yeah. And it is a, a really, really inspiring strike. And it's actually just beaten our record at the LSE for the largest cleanest strike in history, which is another migrant led, uh, women migrant led strike uh, at the LSE, much as St. Bart's is. And they're bringing in 
strike breakers from Scotland. So, you know, the issue of there being a sort of a surplus supply of labour is an issue which the labour movement has always had to face. Mm. Uh, whether that's, you know, labour from, you know, that happens to be living here or happens to have been mm. born here or from wherever they're, they're from. And so, again, I, I just don't think these issues are... Uh, are, are solved by 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 control. I think they're solved by you know better organisation, by you know getting rid of anti-trade union legislation, and by improving uh, employment rights generally. And I think therefore, if you've got well organised workplaces, then an employer is not going to be able to sack you and replace you if all your colleagues are going to walk out on strike, demanding a reinstatement. You know, and they're not going to be able to you know bring in bring in scab labour if they face you know reprisals and repercussions obviously from a well-organised workforce and from a well-organised trade union movement. And the problem is, the trade union movement is just on its knees at the moment. And it's just not trying mm. at all to organise or effectively, with exceptions, there are some great and inspiring exceptions, such as St Bart's, such as uh, many great disputes the RMT's uh, fought and won, uh, and such as uh, some of our disputes at, uh, at, at, at UVW. Uh, but beyond those small, and uh, SOAS and all the rest of it, and beyond those small localised exceptions, the union movement has abandoned generally low paid uh, migrant workers, and that's the problem. And so it's the, it's the job of the union movement to step up to the fight and to actually uh, take control. And, uh, and, and only that way can we really hope to see improvement in wages and, and workers' rights. I think Eddie's got a direct point when it comes to Antonio. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I don't think we're too far in disagreement with each other. Mm. Because what I'm saying is, I do want to control the supply of labour, the, su the flow of capital. But also, what we've got to work on the principle of, is that workers are welcome to come here from other countries, on the basis that they're employed on the nationally collective bargained union rates here. That's how you prevent undercutting of wages. So the point of that is, you can't really, I don't think it's fair to just say, look, the trade unions are in a pile of shit at the moment and it's hard to organise, right? Because that is true, it's a struggle out there, I appreciate that. But unions don't operate in a vacuum. So every game we make in a workplace is only temporary. Mm -hmm. We rely on a political movement behind it to make those gains permanent. So what we need is national collective bargaining agreements. That means a union set a rate for the job and anyone who wants to do that job is paid that rate of pay. Mm -hmm. No undercutting. That's one way you can help solve this problem yeah. of, uh, di of, of, of the competition between workers. And one other point I want to make quickly, it's, it's not directly free movement of labour, but a precursor to that is a flags of convenience operation in a maritime industry where big shipping magnates reflag a ship to a low-wage economy somewhere else, mm. and it means they're allowed to employ workers on that ship at that rate of pay. So we've got a situation now in British waters and on ships that we organise in the RMT where we've got Filipino workers on £2.38 an hour, now, our position is that we, should, that we don't want Filipinos on ships. Our position is they should be on proper wages and terms and conditions the same as a British seafarer should be. And that's the principle we stand by. Now, Karl Marx, when he um, helped draft the programme for the French Workers' Party, one of the points in that said that we must be able to prevent employers importing foreign labour for the purpose of scabbing. And that is what it comes down to. We want to reduce competition between workers restrict the control, you know, we want to control the supply of labour and have the employers in competition mm -hmm. to pay better wages, not the other way around. And that doesn't have to be antagonistic or racist. But this idea that if you're opposed to the free movement of labour within the European Union is somehow a principle that can't be, that can't mm -hmm. be mentioned, then that surely means that you're not in favour of any type of controls on migration at all. And if that's your position and you're criticising Corbyn for not having a position of just complete open borders, that's electoral suicide. It's not a good idea in the first place without all of the controls and everything else you've got. And I just, I just don't see how people can be doing that. And it feeds in to a right-wing attack on Corbyn at the moment from the likes of Chuck Ramuna and all the rest of it. This is a political opportunity of my lifetime and I don't think we should be squandering it by bringing out these spurious arguments attacking Corbyn from a position, although it uses left language, is completely, in my view, a right-wing position. I want to ask you, Antonio, because one thing I've been interested in seeing Movement for Justice on demos is how much your organisation seems to have invested in opposing Brexit, Yeah. whereas <coughs> the European Union is an, is an organisation that discriminates against lots of the people that you repre well, not represent but that you support in detention and people with, mm -hmm. who are struggling with papers etc. Who, who often came from a much more vulnerable place and are in a much more vulnerable situation than someone who, if migration controls changed, wouldn't be able to come from Poland to seek a a higher wage. I think that's a completely legitimate thing to do on a personal level if you want to move abroad to get a higher wage. Good for you. But I mean, why, why are you prioritising Brexit and freedom of movement to the extent that, that you are? 
I mean, it, but it's such a fundamental question. Uh, you'd probably be surprised how many people from the EU are in detention centres, by the way. Oh. Um, a lot. And it's been growing massively. How come? That's um, something I am unaware of. Because you can be up if you're not... Sometimes it's under the excuse that you're not op operating your treaty rights. I think you'll you have to know be the terms better active than... In order to be... Like, to be... To be you, freedom of movement is not the absolute right to just come here and do whatever. Come and go as you please. You have to be employed. There's various conditions with it. And then um, they've been particularly targeting homeless people um, for okay. deportation. There's also a scandal about some homelessness charities turning people into the Home Office. Well, yeah. yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the naive questioner because I feel genuinely naive at this point. I didn't know about this. Uh, so that's... Because what's said in the newspapers a lot is that maybe there could be some reform or if someone hasn't found a job for six months and they have to go. But it's, yeah. the, it's already a situation that... Yeah, I mean, it just means, basically, um, what Corbyn's position means there will be no reversal of any of Theresa May's hostile environment for immigrants. There's mm -hmm. nothing in the manifesto that deals with the hostile environment for immigrants, which basically brought all kinds of services through, you know, basically everything about your life mm -hmm. is, like, monitored and checked, and you have to keep proving who you are. So whether you've got... You know, you're right. To, I mean, it, it's it's got to sink in mm. because we are dealing with a fight against racism and xenophobia. And if we don't deal with it, then there isn't a fight to be made. It's a losing um, battle. It's it means that like there we're living in different bubbles. To be quite mm. honest, life in Britain now is like completely different. Um, if you're on a um, visa or, you know, working any of the number of plethora of different mm. kinds of statuses, mm. whether you're from in the EU or outside, and, and none of it's dealt with in reality in Labour's manifesto as it is. Oh. But, yeah, you're... OK. So, Sorry, I, don't, I want, just want to um, go back to that question of... Because I can see how there was a lot of things absent from the manifesto, yeah. like a lot of anti-racist policies or a lot of policies about the rights the of migrants. And, but the, the freedom of movement seems like a somewhat separate issue yeah but it's it's um it allows still that we're dealing with that same myth that immigrants are the problem it mm -hmm. means that that's left intact that is most important weapon of the right wing to divide you know is the idea that immigrants are your problem is people that are your problem not your employers not the system like the things that you mentioned mm -hmm. it's no no it's people doing things to try and make their life better they're the problem and that's where things are left and um, that undermines our struggle. We have to understand that. Um, in terms of like the yeah um, free movement of people, I always say it that way. Free movement of people is the question. Mm. Frankly, they're just going to negotiate new deals with Donald Trump. They'll be you know in terms of movement of capital. You know their plan is to just cut some deals with Donald Trump and try and save Brexit that way. I mean, that's not going to improve anyone's conditions of life here or whatever his plan is. Um, you know, whatever their call, call to account, whatever their demands for a deal is, that's not going to be better. It's free movement of people. And that's the thing that was under attack in the Brexit campaign. That's why, in reality, it was driven by racism and it drives racism. That's why there was a spike in hate crime. You know, that's why Farage stood in front of that poster you know, of refugees mm -hmm. that aren't even contained in this free movement of people, but because it was that was what it was about. So that's the appeal is to say to people, your problem is all these people. Maybe like and to stereotype people either as like they're going to come as scab labor, they're going to come as like they're going to steal your job. How is that different to saying these are foreigners coming to steal your job? Like we have to move away from that, and you know. <laughs> Just that's that's where it's at. I don't know. To me, it's not complicated that it is racist. The fact that we have members living in places who there's people coming, knocking on people's doors, saying, "Do you want to help packing? We'll help you pack." Mm. They don't care whether you're from the EU or from outside. That's what was happening after Brexit's vote. So it's not a mistake. It's real. The racist attacks, the emboldening of racism, is real. The xenophobia is real. The um, the way that a whole lot of people who never had a problem before feel unwelcome, that's real. They didn't make that up, you know, and they're left out of the conversation in, I think, anything in what Corbyn's talking about there. Um, he's using terms that back that mm -hmm. xenophobia. So it's not even 
uh, fighting to say, well, it's not the people that are the problem. What, where's the agenda then just to fight for the conditions? And uh, anyway, open the borders. Yeah, I'm going to say open the borders. Do you know what? Because people were doing it, crossing the Mediterranean and pulling down fences anyway. They were doing that to save their lives. So it's a real concrete demand because people would, that's where they were at. We need to decide if we are here to fight for a decent quality of life for people or whether we're going to be like an inward looking, you know, kind of nationalistic, more, you know, um, protectionist um, enclave. I think there's lots of food for thought and we're going to come back to all those issues, but we're actually going to take a break now, uh, partly because I desperately need a cup of water. Uh, so we'll be back in two minutes. Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Victory for real people. Us. Us. But for all the darkness, every cause has an effect. 40 years on the roof of Melbourne. <laughs> for all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navara Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarro events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarromedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started. quite enough time to offer anyone water so does anyone want some water please yeah. <laughs> okay i'll think of a question to ask before we start before i give it to you actually otherwise we're going to have an awkward All silence right. um i want to go back to this question of characterizing brexit as racist and more about how do we negotiate the current political climate in britain given that so one thing i think that brexit showed is that the left had sort of failed <coughs> in letting elites and an undemocratic organisation defend a policy that many of us happened to like. So many of us happened to like freedom of movement and thought that was good. But we never really went out and had that argument with people and built up any kind of popular support for it. And we relied on a fairly undemocratic institution with fairly neoliberal motivations to enforce a policy we happened to like. And given where we are now, um, if, you're, if you want to defend freedom of movement, if you want that to be something we keep, how do we do that? And if you're unsure about freedom of movement, how would you navigate this current situation we're in whilst arguing against freedom of movement, but trying to avoid that becoming a generally xenophobic climate? Um, I'm gonna ask Zoe and I'm gonna pour everyone some water. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's the thing, I find it incredibly easy to defend freedom of movement um, and uh, I mean Another Europe is Possible was very much a remain and reform uh, campaign. We said similarly to what you just said, like there's a whole lot of stuff about the EU that we really very deeply are opposed to. Um, but we, uh, we still thought remaining was the best solution, and the fact is we live in a world where the rich have freedom of movement, globally, right? If you're rich enough, you can get the education, and the visa, and the travel, and you can come here. If you're rich enough, you don't even have to speak English, or have any job lined up or anything, because if you can show a certain amount in your bank account, you can just come here, right? And then if you're rich enough, you can, you can apply for those visas and everything, right? For the poor people of this world, who are not European citizens, we have the refugee crisis, right? That's what we've seen. If you need to flee your home and you need to go to the op opportunities that all of us sitting in this room take absolutely for granted every single day, 
right? That freedom, that safety, that prosperity that we all take absolutely for granted, right? Then, and you're not rich and you're not European, then you get the refugee crisis. Then you're piled up at the borders, then you're drowning in the Mediterranean, then you're giving birth in a muddy field next to a fence being tear gassed by Hungarian border guards, right? What freedom of movement has done, not enough, right? But for a certain group of people so far, is mean that the opportunities of movement are available to all, right? So the working class people, the poor people, right, don't have to be excluded from the opportunities of mobility, right? Um, and so to be against freedom of movement is to be against the opportunities of mobility for the poor. And to be... Pro the poor within Europe. Yeah, the poor within Europe, to add them to the poor within the rest of the world. And to just say that we'll go along with this world that we have where only the rich can travel and it's getting easier and easier for us while it's getting harder and harder for them and um i don't i don't buy into that and i also know for a fact and you all do too that again given the world we live in immigration is not going anywhere we're not going to get it down to the tens of thousands or zero net migration it's just not really realistic and none of the right wing or left wing proponents of brexit <laughs> actually even want that, right? What they want is a class of people who can be more easily exploited, who can be pitted against each other. If you come here under freedom of movement rules, you have the right to be treated like any other British citizen, right? In work, in social housing, and so on and so forth, right? That... So, so you basically think, make, make that argument, uh, how are you, you going to convince 50 plus percent of, of the British electorate to get behind that? I think by, well, doing the opposite of what Corbyn's done, mm -hmm. right? So absolutely rejecting narratives that say we're mass importing Eastern Europeans. That is the exact opposite of what I would do. I would stand up again and again, and I do, and make these arguments and join together with uh, migrants from the EU and from the rest of the world to make the arguments together about how when we stand together, we're all better off. And also, I mean, I know that we got to make more emotional arguments, Brexit appealed to emotions, people aren't interested in the facts, but the facts still do remain that, as you mentioned at the beginning, and it can never be said enough, that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that freedom of movement brings down wages. I would just add just one last little fact, fun thing, which is that EU migrant, all, overall, we all know, immigration brings a net economic benefit to mm. the UK, right, because people work good jobs, um, and then they end up paying taxes and that goes towards our public services and so on. But people from the EU make a much higher net economic benefit to the UK economy. Now, that's not because they're better, harder workers. It's not because, you know, they, they're able to get better jobs. Uh, it's because, well, it is because they're able to get better jobs because they have flexibility. They can come and go. Mm -hmm. When they have a good job, they can come here. If there's a better job available in Germany, they can go there and they know they can come back and they've got rights in each of those places. They've got a labour market available to them. So let's not just talk about the labour, you know, this labour force being available to employers. Workers have a huge labour market available to them where they have rights, right? Where they can move and come and go. And all the evidence shows that when you crack down on people's ability to move, you do not make them leave. You just make them stay in poorer conditions and be more vulnerable to exploita exploitation. And there are a thousand studies that I could cite to you uh, that show that again and again. So removing freedom of movement, whether or not you actually think that this neoliberal project, etc., etc., that's the world we live in. And removing it will make things so much worse for the most vulnerable, for the poorest, for the working classes. And that is just not a left-wing perspective. I think there's an issue that comes up that's actually quite difficult to navigate if you're not like a social science, so one social scientist who understands all the data and all the papers, which is, I, I include myself in that, which is, there's lots of uh, academic papers that say it doesn't really affect wages, and even in certain industries where it does affect it, it only affects it by about 0.5%. At the same time, you've got a lot of people, like probably the people you were organising with uh, in the RMT, who exper who, whose experience is specifically that migrant labour has damaged their working conditions. And the problem is, or there can be a problem, or I think there is a problem in British politics at the moment, where there's people with a, pa with a statistical paper telling people who have this certain experience that your experience is wrong because my statistical paper shows it to be wrong. Um, so I don't know how that's going to develop into a question. But... 
Does that make sense? Does that, is that what you think, Eddie? Or? Yeah, well, I think I sort of understand what you're saying, but I, I just want to get back to the point I'm trying to make, and that is the free movement of labour isn't an isolated thing that operates on its own and has directly all the responsibility for, or not, of wage conditions and everything else. It undermines collective bargaining, which is what the biggest problem is. Mm -hmm. There isn't always, in every industry, a direct attack on wages, depending on the level of organisation and, and the local factors in that industry. So, for example, if you look at Romania, the, the uh, combination of the two, collective bargaining, uh, the uh, free movement of labour and the free movement of capital, when mm -hmm. they're joining the EU, but they had nearly 90% collective bargaining rates in their country. It's dropped to 20 you know, you've got youth unemployment 50% in, in some parts of the EU. And, and, and the two things work together. And, this, uh, and, and there's, there's, a point, there's a point my comrade made here that, that's, that's, that's particularly pertinent. And that is the narrative that makes it a problem when you're talking about immigration. It's a problem of individuals. Mm. That particular worker, that immigrant. And, and that's the problem. There's a flip side to that as well. And that's viewing the free movement of, of, of labour as an individual right. When what we should be focused on is collective rights and collective action. Because free movement of labour is only free movement as long as you keep moving. As soon as you stop and you demand a house to live in, or education for your kids, or a decent, decent social services, your freedoms are win now. I mean, I ain't got the freedom of movement to go and live in Indian Thames, for example, mm. because of all the economic factors of it. So it's, it's not a real freedom. What we should be demanding is collective freedoms, like, for example, national collective bargaining arrangements that covers every worker in an industry, access to housing, education, those are real right, real rights, not these individual sort of like half rights, people painters rights. We should be rejecting that. But I mean, so the, the, the problem is, so people want change, right? People <coughs> recognise that their rights in work are being undermined. Mm. But the question is, what change do we tell them is, is the best one, right? Or what change do we come together as the best one? And say someone like, I mean, Paul Mason obviously flip flops on sort of like his opinion on freedom of movement. But one suggestion he had was closed shop unions. And if you have closed shop unions, which means wherever you're from, you can only join this workplace if you're a member of a trade union. Doesn't that just itself solve all the problems that freedom of movement potentially uh, brings about? And therefore we can say migration isn't the problem, it's the lack of closed shop unions which is the problem. And then we can stand behind a position which is let's have closed shop unions, but migration's fine. Oh, I'm completely in favour of closed shops. But what, but closed shops plus freedom of movement? I think, or? I think closed shops would be um, a massive positive step in the direction of, yeah. of, of, of removing the competition between workers. But I still think you can't have a position of open borders under capitalism. It's com just complete nonsense. Um, nobody wants it, except, you know, there's like a tiny fraction of people that even talk about it. Mm. Most people in the country wouldn't entertain the idea. And if you make that sort of a demand on Corbyn, when we're about to, you know, we're on the cusp of achieving the biggest political victory of, of my class in my whole lifetime. Coming out with this sort of rubbish, it just distracts people. Anyway, it's always about Ant Ant I'm going to go for Antonio, you look, you look sceptical. Yeah, well, oh, okay, sceptical about, about closed shop unions. I'm thinking, hold on, weren't yeah, they shop. used for, weren't, were, were they not colour bars in unions, essentially? Well, that was, they? But that's because if you've got oh, a racist union. I can tell you a story keeping, about sorry, the colour bars. The colour bars were broken by an Irish worker and a Caribbean worker that were members of my union. Well, yeah, and they, good, and they, and they had the to fight, in 1966. but weren't closed shops ways of... And, and the know. reason they were able to do that in 1966 is because they had a closed shop and everybody in that organisation was a member of their union. Okay. That's how they did it. There's a, there's a generational gap, and talking on the subject you were raising about the experience of people, yeah. um, let's not use it as code for only one set of people. The experience for a younger generation is you grow up in an integrated society the most integrated generation the idea of like people being from different places is so much more what is actually good about mm. you know about this country it is it's multicultural it's multiracial it's like so many different backgrounds and the younger generation voted remain now i don't think that they were voting for the EU to blackmail Greece or, you know, the EU to let people drown in the sea or anything. But it was felt as um, the, you know, my friends are from everywhere mm. and, and I want them to have the right to stay. And try imagining, unpicking what the society is now when you're having families who 
Some are from here, some are from other parts of Europe, some are from outside Europe. Who's going to have the right to stay? Like, unpick. Because our communities and London and the places that were the most, um, you know, remain were the most overwhelmingly integrated places, London, but not just London, even when you look down to different areas where there's more of an experience of immigration, there's much more of a remain mm. um, vote and the younger voters and, and so on. The same people who were overwhelmingly voting for Corbyn as leader who were fighting for Labour, that's where the heart of the energy came from in that campaign. So this is why, to me, it's a, a betrayal in reality. There is a whole experience that's telling people why the importance of the free movement of people, the, mm. the ability to come and go, the fact that you may have a parent, you know, two parents from different, you know, parts. So, OK, so you can be in a situation now where if you earn a certain amount, will that mean you get to stay if you're your spouse, whether you can bring your partner to come and live with you? So, so I mean, well, that's a problem Cor for anyone Corbyn outside the anyone... EU, but now it's going to be a problem for everyone yeah. in the EU as well. Corbyn said that anyone here will have the right to remain. In that, oh, in that great, interview. you can have the right to remain whilst you're in Britain, but can you also, like, if you're of an integrated family from different backgrounds, you won't have the right to necessarily remain. If you leave, can mm. you come back? You you have to get into the machinations of what immigration and what immigration controls mean already, because I'll say this about Britain. Britain already has some of the harshest, most hostile anti-immigrant policies, you know, in Europe. Some of, you know, I think, you know... There are some other places that have harsh, but Britain is the place that has indefinite detention. Nowhere else. Mm -hmm. Britain is the place that has the most detention centres, prisons built just to hold people with a question mark over their status. In terms of a political demand, what do you want? A second referendum? Um, yeah, I want to defend the free movement of people. Mm -hmm. No new immigration control should be a demand. We're going to do a rally at the Labour Party conference mm -hmm. and we're going to be fighting for them to take that. Uh, but, or to galvanise I mean, people but who I think do feel that way, mm. to make a demand. Yeah, we do need to, because there's another immigration bill around the corner. We already had two, and they're just criminalising people. The the um, mechanisms for um, um, attacking, monitoring, controlling, and it is a form of social control, like, already are in place. They're there. They're just expanding to more and more people. So you want you want the Labour Party to have a policy of complete open borders? in the whole world. <laughs> They're not going to go with a whole <laughs> open the borders, but that's our demand, so I don't, you know... What, yeah. What, yeah, you it's know like, I mean, it's fine to have a demand that you don't think the Labour Party's going to take on, but it's just a specific we're question We're going to make the what... demand no matter what. Yeah. Um, where I think that there's a whole lot of a heart of, of, of this, the new people who have been joining Labour who would be quite surprised to see <laughs> Corbyn repeating words that sound like UKIP, mm. um, who will be feeling like, no, but we, we did want, we do want our friends to have a right to stay. We don't want our families torn apart. We don't want to lose our schoolmates from the same classroom. You grow up together, but, you know, one was born here, or one that wasn't, or one's parents are from somewhere else, so they're not a British citizen. We're already seeing people who grew up, you know, their entire life has been in this country, who end up in detention centres getting to deported to countries is, they don't even remember. Does that have anything to do with leaving happen? the EU, though? Or? I'm saying that it has to do with the whole question of immigration, and this, this Brexit mm -hmm. was around immigration. Immigration was the issue. It was the guiding issue, and everything else could be sacrificed. It's interesting to me that the far right of the Tory party are so into um, Brexit, and there is such a parallel to, you know, the kind of, um, you know, attacks on, on workers' rights. They see this as a way forward mm -hmm. of attacking workers' rights and exploiting <coughs> people further and better and, and, you know, more consistently. I'm so, yeah, why, why, is there such a, why is there such a parallel then? Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been talking a while, so I'm going to ask a final question and do a, do a go-around, um, which is, I think it'll be based on... Because I don't think uh, Corbyn supporters do actually seem that upset about this uh, in the main. And I think one reason there is that people see anti-racism as something that's an absolute red line. But they don't see the freedom of movement of Labour as necessarily linked with anti-racism. And they don't, wanna, they don't want Labour to die on the altar of freedom of Labour, freedom of movement of Labour, when what we want to be advocating for in the strongest possible terms is human rights, anti-racism, and people associate that more with 
refugees and asylum seekers than other white people in Europe. And I want to ask the question, which is going to be different for all of you, I suppose, because you've got different stances. But why do you think, or, and why do you think, that this freedom of movement of labour is an issue that we really have to channel? Can we not separate an anti-racist Labour Party policy from the advocacy of freedom of movement? I'm going to go around, start with Zoe. I'm going to assume you're going to say we can, but elaborate on that. <laughs> so, Zoe. Can we separate opposition to the freedom of movement of Labour from racism? Um, mm, I don't think that you can separate xenophobia from racism very satisfactorily. Um, I don't think that you can separate the general feeling of antagonism towards freedom of movement from xenophobia at least. So, no. Um, the, the reality is that you are asking us to not split the movement by sacrificing uh, the rights of all the immigrants who have equality to us. Um, it's all, a the Europe, all the immigrants who come from the Europe. So the ones that we have so far, so this is a, our position is to defend and extend freedom of movement. I wouldn't uh, argue for the immediate opening of UK borders to the entire world. I don't think that's that would be um, a good uh, result, but that that a, a world of more mobility is certainly the direction that I would argue is preferable. Um, it's I think it's an absolutely defining fundamental issue for the left, right? The the left has to be an international uh, solidarity uh, movement, or it is nothing. Um, and uh, Corbyn, in particular, you know, we talk about this opportunity that he has. Like he can't um, fulfil one single beautifully costed, really exciting left wing uh, manifesto pledge if we have this. Uh, completely country destroying hard Brexit that he's also pursuing. The, and off the back of that, we see people who, millions of people in this country, who frankly, I don't have any right to a better life than just because I was like endowed with the right passport, to, uh, you know, in danger of losing their rights. The rolling back of rights, rather than the advancement of the argument that people who are here should have equal rights that includes in, in the workplace and that allows them to collectively bargain for better conditions. It is, to me, it's just an absolute no-brainer for the left. If you start dividing people, workers and so on, <coughs> and disadvantaging those based on completely arbitrary privilege of nationality, um, you've completely lost the moral argument, the practical argument. I, I just don't see how it could be, and I, th I, I agree with so much of what you said about how we need stronger trade unions and better workplace protection and so on and so forth. Those are the answers. Getting rid of freedom of movement is not the answer. Stripping three and a half million people in this country of their fundamental rights is not the answer. Stripping all of us of the opportunities to travel is not the answer. Rolling back the rights of minorities and immigrants is not the answer. Thank you, Petros. Okay, so um, <clears throat> a lot's been said since I last spoke, so I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going to try and I'm not gonna try and come back on all those points. But Plug a couple of things, fun. yeah, a, a, couple, a couple of things stood out. Um, one way to sort of, one way to counter the narrative that I think we should all be doing the anti-immigrant narrative, regardless of your position on free, mo uh, on free movement, uh, is to just promote the successes of uh, of organised migrant workers uh, first and foremost. And I think we should be seeing a lot more headlines out there. Uh, in newspapers and in social media, you know, migrant workers win this, migrant workers win that. And if we actually, because, you know, we don't need to sensationalise it, it's happening all over the place. Uh, and uh, some of the biggest successes in the labour movement, as history has shown, what's happening today and what history has, so, has, has shown, it come from uh, large migrant sectors of the workforce. And I think it's history repeating itself. Some of the most uh, innovative and exciting and successful uh, labour struggles have been, has been fought by migrant workers. And I think we just need to start to, 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 to churn those headlines out. You know, migrant workers win this, migrant workers, migrant workers win that. And obviously that will provide a counter-narrative to the claim that they're you know, just accepting whatever crap they get thrown at them and, and, and that has a knock-on effect for other workers, which is, which is just not the case. Um, the issue of closed shops, yeah, I think closed shops, obviously there's a... Yeah, I mean, arguably they're... They make perfect sense, but they can fall into the hands of employers uh, through sweetheart 
unions and sweetheart deals, and that would obviously have to be resisted uh, if you were to sort of promote a closed shop um, system. Um, collective bargaining agreements are at their lowest ever, I think, in the last hundred years. So when we look at sort of the you know sectors are completely <coughs> dominated by employers these days for the last decades. You know there has been no organised labour within. Le particularly the service sector, which is the low paid sector, you know, the trade, you know, there are, so employers have, have, have become, a, employers are extremely arrogant these days. They, they, ha, they have no fear. They set the wages, they set the terms and conditions, they set the workloads, and nobody is challenging them. The trade union movement is not challenging them. Um, and so clearly that is going to have to, that is going to have to change. Uh, it can change. It's going it's to require a lot of uh, innovative thought uh, and a lot of resources, but it definitely can change. Um, and the final point I wanted to come back on, just to pick up on something Zoe said, just perhaps for another debate, but I'm not sure if it's a tenable position to be uh, in favour of free movement uh, within EU, but not uh, globally. I mean, I, I don't... I defend an extent. So, like, not open borders for the entire world tomorrow. See, I don't Obviously think that's... I do mean yeah. that it should be... I think you either have to be in, in favour of... This is, I'm going to be slightly provocative with this, but, but, but why not? I think, you, I think uh, the only tenable position is to be in favour of full control or no control. And I don't think there's a tenable position uh, in between. Sure, and but you can say that you're going to have to be another debate. To get <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, I think I, I I can see some arguments that, that could be advanced, but I think ultimately, morally, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna have to be a full control or no control position, which I think is the most tenable. Because ultimately, what do we owe to the EU? What do we owe to people within the EU? Absolutely nothing. And arguably, we all we owe uh, you know as an imperialist and colonialist country, we owe a lot more, obviously to uh, a lot of people outside of the EU and so if we're going to open our borders then it should certainly be as much to uh, uh, people outside of the EU as to those within the EU. So just on that, I thought I'd just end it on that, on, on that note. Eddie? Yeah, I think, um, well first of all I think Corbyn's absolutely right in everything he said and I, do, and I endorse what he said. Uh, and I think on top of that, I hate it when people from this uh, free movement position continue to think they can speak on behalf of all minorities and all migrants in the country as if somehow they had some kind of, you know, broad, you know, everyone's got the same view, because it's just not the case. I'm a member of the Connolly Association. It's the oldest organisation of Irish workers in this country, founded in the 30s by international brigaders. We campaigned very hard for a Brexit in this country on a national question and the implications for Ireland and everything else. Uh, and while we were doing that, we campaigned alongside the Indian Workers Association, which has got a very long history in this country and actually helped was one of the constituents that helped the, R the RMT, the NUI as it was back then, break the colour bar in 1966 and, and bring race, race, uh, race discrimination into employment legislation for the first time. So we campaigned with, with, together on a ticket for Brexit. So there's not this idea that all migrants have somehow got um, a point of view that their rights are being damaged by um, losing the free movement of labour. There's a lot of migrants and a lot of migrant workers in this country that understand what the EU is that it's a neoliberal institution, it's imperialist, that it's, uh, the single market is, is one thing, the single market is a Thatcherite straitjacket for anyone who's interested in initiating socialist policies. It's right that it goes in the bin. The country is broadly in favour of getting rid of it. Corbett is finally speaking uh, in terms that broadly reflect, I think, the opinion of the working class in this country. And I don't accept that it's a racist point of view. The working class in this country is probably the most diverse, multiracial, um, you know, uh, working class anywhere you can find. It's the most tolerant in my view. Yes, there's racism, of course there is, and we've got to fight against that. Um, but, you know, me, I'm an Irishman. I'm proud to be a member of the British working class, because that's where I work, with people from all around the world. And I think the right thing to do is get rid of the free movement, get rid of the single market, most importantly. And we've got to do it on the basis that our movement stands for the democratic ownership and control of the economy, all of it. There ain't a bit of it that we want to give to the uh, boss class. There ain't any section of the economy we want to leave just to the, to the, to the anarchy of the markets. We want to take it all into ownership and we want to run things. We want a planned economy. And that means taking control of the, of the movements of capital and of labour because we want to see socialism. Antonio, you get the final word. Um, well, your question is about can we separate? Can we separate obviously... the abandonment of freedom of movement of labour with racism? Can we be both anti-racist and question or oppose the freedom of movement of labour. And I just think we have to look at the practical way that um, attacking immigration and through Brexit, which te technically means the EU, but in reality it was that the campaign was conducted as an attack on immigration. 
So since that's true, we have to fight over that. That's not like to celebrate the EU as anything wonderful or whatever, but um, how do you unpick? I mean, look at what we're about to face, unpicking families, communities. I don't doubt, in fact, I've been repeating many times, to be quite frank, immigrant communities have been at the forefront of progressive struggles in this country for like generation upon generation upon generation. And that has meant a fight within the British working class over its racism. It means we have to fight racism within our movement. We don't take for granted that it doesn't exist. It does exist. It's not in the interest of any of the poor and exploited, any of the working classes. It's not in the material interests, but it is still a factor. It's in the material interests of the elite, of the ruling classes, yeah, to hold on to racism, but look at how hard they're willing to sacrifice so much for a policy that attacks immigration. Anti-immigrant rhetoric is so important. It is the thing, Brexit is the thing holding Theresa May in place right now. Why prop her up? Why help her? Like it is the thing and an anti-immigrant policy is like the one thing they want to hold on to because it is just the most important weapon against people who should be fighting together. And I just think that as it's just, you know, we're going to have to fight for a different Europe. We're not mm -hmm. going back to an old one. You know, um, we were in a fight for immigrant rights across Europe in any case. We're in a fight against racism across Europe in any case. But putting up more borders and becoming more protectionist doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't solve that. It actually makes it harder. It's actually been a huge boost for the far right, not just here, but around the world. Thank you so much all for coming this evening. At kind of short notice, we organised this late in the afternoon. It's been a hectic day in, in Navarro Towers. Um, and I'm sure we'll be continuing this debate in the months and years ahead. It's the perennial debate that happens whenever the left gets anywhere near to power. Um, this was The Fix. This was Navarro Media. We'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>